Hi, my name is Eli Milosovsky. I'm a rheumatologist at Mass General Hospital, and I co-direct the Vasculitis and Glomerulonephritis Center here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about ANCA-associated vasculitis, but I wanted to start with just mentioning what vasculitis is. It's a group of over a dozen conditions that's defined by the immune system attacking blood vessels. That narrows blood vessels and decreases blood flow to organs, therefore causing organ damage. Therefore, these conditions are really important to diagnose and treat early. Now, ANCA-associated vasculitis are a group of conditions that affect the small vessels of the body, and they're the most common small vessel vasculitis. They're defined under that ANCA-associated vasculitis umbrella because the three conditions in it all share similar features, and that is being positive for the ANCA test in the blood, uh, which is present in 70 to 80 percent of patients with these conditions, um, as well as causing inflammation in similar organs. Now, the three conditions in this group are called granulomatosis with polyangiitis, GPA for short. This used to be known as Wegener's granulomatosis, microscopic polyangiitis, MPA for short, and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or eGPA for short. And that condition used to be known as Churk-Strauss syndrome. Now, these conditions um, share many similarities, as I mentioned, including the organs they affect. So commonly affected organs are the lung, where you could have bleeding manifesting as shortness of breath and coughing up blood. Kidney, which causes a kidney inflammation called a glomerulonephritis. The peripheral nerves, which can cause numbness and weakness in the legs or arms. A skin rash, that's known as palpable purpura. Joint pain, and then just feeling unwell. Fevers, weight loss, and night sweats. Now, the conditions are different though because they do have some unique manifestations. For example, GPA frequently causes this very severe sinus inflammation, sinusitis that can be painful and destroy some of the structures and bones in the nose. eGPA is unique because there's usually a very high level of eosinophils, which is part of the, your blood cells um, that are found in the blood. And patients often develop pretty severe asthma, um, runny nose, and nasal polyps before the onset of some of those manifestations of vasculitis in the lung and the kidney that I mentioned earlier. Um, generally, these conditions are diagnosed by the presence of ANCA in the blood, like I mentioned, but in particular in patients who have a negative ANCA, organ biopsy is important to confirm the diagnosis. Now I wanna shift and talk a little about a little bit about treatment. The goal of treatment in these conditions is really to achieve complete disease control, meaning no active manifestations of vasculitis. Now in eGPA specifically, sometimes people are left with some of the asthma manifestations, but the organ inflammation that I mentioned before, the goal is to control that completely. Therefore, we think of treatment in these conditions in two stages, the treatment, uh, the induction phase, and then the maintenance phase, which is when you've achieved remission, preventing future relapse, because many patients with these diseases can flare over time. Um, and in only a minority of patients will these diseases go away after the first round of treatment. Typically, treatments used for induction are two medicines, steroids like prednisone and either rituximab or cyclophosphamide. Um, there's a new medicine called avacapan that uh, may have a role in limiting or reducing uh, the use of prednisone in GPA and MPA. And in eGPA, all of those treatments are used, but there's also more targeted treatments at the eosinophil, specifically, like mepolizumab. For maintenance, generally patients will remain on one of the agents that they were on during the induction phase. In GPA and MPA, that's commonly rituximab, although there are other options as well. And in eGPA, that may be mepolizumab or uh, one of the other agents used in induction phase. It's important to know that most patients with these conditions are treated successfully, and more than 90% of patients will achieve full disease control. However, some patients are left with organ damage, kidney injury, persistent numbness and weakness if the nerves are involved, persistent sinus symptoms, and it's important 
for your rheumatologist to determine whether those symptoms might be active disease or damage from prior disease in terms of directing your therapy. The other thing I'll mention is even though these treatments are really effective, they do have downsides. For example, all of these medicines work by decreasing the function of your immune system, so patients on these conditions are more predisposed to infection. And inflammation in the body can also lead to buildup of cholesterol in the blood vessels, specifically the blood vessels affecting the, your heart. And so patients with these conditions may have a higher risk of things like heart attacks. Therefore, it's important to take any measure you can to limit those side effects. Things like getting vaccinated and being watchful for any signs of infection, following a heart-healthy diet, controlling blood pressure and cholesterol are all really important to have good outcomes if you're a patient with one of these conditions. Looking to the future, there's a lot of research going on in these conditions, including by our group at MGH. And so even though the outcomes in these conditions are already really good, they're likely to get better in the near future.